हेलो हेलो गुड आफ्टरनून मैम या गुड आफ्टरनून सो आई हैव जस्ट स्पोकन टू सर सो ही वुड बी सेस ही बी जॉइनिंग इन लाइक फ्यू मिनट्स ओके ओके नो प्रॉब्लम मैम यू विल गेट द क्वेश्चंस इन द चैट बॉक्स प्राइवेटली सो ओनली यू विल बी एबल टू सी द ऑडियंस क्वेश्चन ओके ओके द नॉर्मल चैट बॉक्स राइट या सॉरी आई एम नॉट एबल टू हियर यू मैम आई हैव जस्ट सेड यू गुड आफ्टरनून इन द चैट बॉक्स या या सो फ्रॉम योर यू विल गेट द क्वेश्चंस ओके श्योर ओके आई थिंक सो सर इज डन Hello, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning, sir. One minute. I just uh, see if I'm able to share the screen yeah. properly. Sure, sure. Sir. Yeah, is the screen okay? Yes, sir. It is okay. We're able to see it. Is audio okay? Yes, sir. Audio is also okay. Video audio. Okay, I'm ready. Yeah. Sure, sir. I'll just get back in three minutes. I just no problem, sir. Uh, we will uh, join by. Uh, A few minutes before the meeting, sir. At twelve, we'll start exactly. So you. Now oh, it's eleven forty-eight. I'll join back at eleven fifty-four. Okay, is that okay for you? Sure, that's okay. Then. That's okay. Okay.
Shama, only three minutes more. Yes, sir. We will start exactly by that. Sir. I'll finish by 50 to 55 minutes. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Okay. There are going to be questions from the audience. You're going to take questions? Yes, sir. We'll be taking questions, sir, from the audience, from the chat box. You will be putting it up in the box or chat box, or it will come in the chat box automatically? Yes, sir. It will be on the chat box, and I'll read it out to you, sir. Don't worry. Don't worry. Okay. And it'll also be on the chat box, sir. Yeah. You are recording it. Uh, we would also be recording it, sir. Yes. Please send the uh, recording to me later. Sure, sure, sir. That's fair. Uh, Jay, please let us know when to start. Because there is only two more minutes left. Uh, okay. Very good afternoon, one and all, respected doctors and participants who have joined the webinar. Thank you all for joining in. I'm Murshida at Dr. Reddy's, who will be moderating the session today. Uh, it is my honor to welcome respected Dr. Balasubramanian, sir, to this webinar. Thank you so much, sir, for having accepted it to be the speaker to this webinar. Few words of introduction about, sir. Serves as a medical director and HOD pediatrics in the Kanchi Kamakoti Child Trust Hospital at Chennai. Also serves as a honorary pediatrician at the Southern Railway Hospital, Chennai. And his areas of interest include uh, infectious diseases, pulmonology, PG education, and clinical OSCE training. And he has over 75 index publications. And with 32 years of teaching uh, experience in clinical pediatrics and over 500 sessions he has conducted uh, in terms of CMEs and PG training programs. And he's been awarded the Distinguished DNB Teacher uh, NB Award 2014 and a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Tamil Nadu uh, Dr. NGR Medical University. And uh, he has over 90 indexed publications and contributions to 10 uh, book chapters and he's also served as examiner at the MRC PCH UK. And uh, he's also an ACVIP uh, convener as well as advisor 2020. It is our honor, sir, to have you as a speaker to the webinar. And he'll be taking us through the topic called as uh, laboratory investigations in respiratory tract infections. So looking forward to your presentation, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for the very generous introduction. Uh, friends, uh, uh, today I'm going to take up a, a topic.
topic of interest to general pediatricians and specialists in respiratory medicine. And I'm going to take you through to the topic of laboratory diagnosis of respiratory infections. And uh, the focus in this session would be a discussion on should we do a lab diagnosis of RTA at all? To discuss that, I'm going to take you through some case scenarios from my personal file and would we'll discuss the clinical dilemmas a general pediatrician like me faces when we encounter such cases. And definitely, I'll be talking about the new developments and also give an overview of future of investigations, particularly molecular diagnostics in respiratory tract infection with a summary and a same approach to lab diagnosis of respiratory infection. The first and foremost question is, are laboratory investigations required in respiratory tract infection at all? In fact, most of the respiratory tract infections in pediatrics as well as in adults are viral. And most of them do not require antibiotics, though they may get, they may receive antibiotics inappropriately. Rationally, 90 to 95 percent of respiratory infections would not require any intervention in the, in the form of antibiotic therapy. And even if we give antibiotics, we do give antibiotics most of the time empirically and not based on laboratory investigations. Then why talk about labs? That is exactly the reason I'm going to address today. Lab diagnosis of respiratory tract infection helps in antibiotic stewardship. When I said that most do not need antibiotics, the reason is that majority of them are caused by viral infections. To ensure that antibiotic stewardship is practiced, we may have to have lab diagnosis in respiratory tract infections, particularly low respiratory tract infection. Let us start from the upper airway with a case scenario. This is a six-year-old boy who came with fever and sore throat. He had fever for about two days, severe throat pain. Nobody else in the family has had fever. And uh, on examination, he had fever of 102 Fahrenheit. And look at the clinical picture. He has exudates in both the tonsils. And the uvula is almost like, you know, a red a chili, beefy red. The tongue is red. There is chelitis. And you see here carefully, there is also some scaling of the skin around the perioral region and even down around the mouth. So this is a scenario, sore throat, sore throat, exudative tonsillitis, beefy red uvula, some exfoliation of skin around. And look at his tongue. This is strawberry tongue. And this is the scenario. At this point of time, we also examined his trunk and we found scaly lesions in the trunk, suggesting a sandpaper rash. And it looked like scarlet fever. Sore throat, exudative tonsillitis, rash, high fever, no cough or chorizo. You know it could be beta streptococcal pharyngitis. At this point of time, if you introspect and ask yourself, what lab tests are required? What investigations are appropriate in this URTI? Will you do complete blood counts? Will you do rapid antigen tests for streptococcus? Will you do throat swab for culture? Or dump all the tests and say, this is scarlet fever, 100%. Don't do any tests and straight away give antibiotic or reassure them it is viral. That's the foremost question for the clinician. The dilemmas the clinician has in such scenarios are two. How do you differentiate clinically viral versus bacterial pharyngotonsillitis? And how useful are throat swab culture and rapid antigen detection tests? 
do you do cbc crp at all what is the answer if you look at evidence based practice guidelines it is suggested that if the clinical and epidemiological features are not suggestive for group a beta hemolytic streptococcus pharyngitis what do you mean by that if the child has got cold cough other members have also got fever running nose there is no exudate child is well no investigations and no treatment you reassure you give paracetamol normal saline drops and send them salt water goggle at the most on the other hand if a child has features suggestive of bacterial pharyngitis what do you mean by suggestive of bacterial pharyngitis you do the modified centaur score and if it is more than 3 and there is a possibility of group a beta hemolytic streptococcus pharyngitis the current recommendation is that you should perform a rapid antigen detection test for streptococcus and if it is positive you don't have to do any tests you can give antibiotics you don't have to do a throat swab culture on the other hand if you strongly suspect streptococcal pharyngitis you perform a rapid antigen test and if it is negative you can consider performing a throat swab culture if that is positive you treat if that is negative you don't treat at all in other words the rapid antigen test for streptococcus is a very cost effective office practice tool it costs hardly 100 to 125 rupees is widely available and uh, in india very few centers very few pediatricians carry out this test unfortunately i would say instead of prescribing antibiotics irrationally we can perform this test and we published our data from our hospital where we showed that the sensitivity of the rapid antigen test was around 89.7% the specificity was higher 98.4% we concluded that it should be performed in all cases with a modified centaur score of more than 3 3 or less you don't have to do any tests at all case number 2 this is an infant who is 2 months old the infant has cough tachypnea wheeze and low grade fever hovering around 99 to 100 and the pediatrician diagnoses lra or pneumonia and takes an x ray the x ray finding is that of suggestive of atelectasis in the right upper lobe you see the minor fissure being pulled up the triangular shadow is there the question is is it pneumonia or bronchiolitis is it bacterial or viral that's the foremost question and in introspection you ask yourself what tests are required do you do a cbc or crp cbc if it shows counts of over 25000 maybe bacterial pneumonia may be there if it shows lymphocytosis viral may viral lra may be the diagnosis crp is often not very useful but however if the crp is greater than 100 pneumococcal pneumonia is a possibility do you do rsv rapid antigen test and if you are working in a corporate hospital do you ask for multiplex pcr respiratory panel from the nasopharyngeal aspirate do you do h1n1 pcr now with covid 19 around do you do covid 19 nasopharyngeal swab for pcr gene expert or rapid antigen test that these are the questions uppermost in our mind before we try to answer these questions there are some more questions i am posing the questions are what is is there a role for multiplex pcr in lower respiratory tract infection today do you do it in practice do you do testing for h1n1 or rsv in practice or in the hospital what about test for covid 19 let us take up these issues one by one nowadays multiplex pcr platforms have been set in several corporate hospitals and several good laboratories the most commonly performed respiratory panel 
is the film array biofire, which gives you where you send an esophageal swab or aspirate or a ball specimen, and you ask for this film array panel, you get reports for 21 pathogens using PCR. And it includes several viruses starting from influenza to RSV to para-influenza to the old corona. And bacteria, which includes pertussis, parapertussis, chlamydia, and mycoplasma and pneumonia. And now new panels are available where more than, more than 35 pathogens are being identified using this PCR. Coming to the diagnosis of RSV infection, which is most likely in this case scenario of a two month old infant with LRI and V's, you must remember RSV can be identified by several methods. One, you can do a rapid antigen test, very similar to streptococcal rapid antigen test. A slight test is available and it gives you a report within five minutes. Cost effective, very cheap. You can perform viral culture, which is the gold standard, or you can do PCR or direct immunofluorescence assay and identify RSV. When it comes to the rapid, and rapid test for RSV, this test is widely available. It costs only around 500 rupees. You yourself can do it, or your microbiologist can do it and give a report within five minutes. The sensitivity ranges from 80 to 99, 90%. It's very cheap. On the other hand, it has got several limitations. If the child has been suffering from LRI for more than a few days, this may not be positive, only PCR will pick it up. But as a screening test, it is extremely useful. If it clinically fits into our clinical diagnosis, if it is positive, you don't have to give antibiotic, you can counsel the family. This is likely to be a self-limiting RSV bronchiolitis. Recently, a new tool has been identified to identify children with bronchiolitis or infants with bronchiolitis who have severe disease. The test is NT-ProBNP. Studies have shown BNP levels and NT pro BNP levels are likely to be very high in severe bronchiolitis, particularly those who develop acute cardiac failure. And if they are very high, these infants have to be transferred to a PICU for better management. This is a new test which has been validated well as quoted in the reference. Coming to the diagnosis of influenza, particularly H1N1 for which therapy in the form of oseltamivir is available. Screening tests are not recommended. Ideal test recommended is PCR, which will give you a report within few hours. And nasopharyngeal swab specimen, nasopharyngeal or nasal swab specimen within four days of onset could identify influenza accurately. Nasopharyngeal swab has got the highest yield and you can offer the therapy with oseltamivir if it is positive. Coming to the diagnosis of COVID-19, which is the burning topic today, currently in outpatient and inpatient practice, we have three available tests for diagnosis of COVID-19. Number one is polymerase chain reaction test, which includes the true NAT or gene expert test. And they are considered the gold standard for detection of acute infection, COVID-19. They have got sensitivity and specificity to the extent of 70%. It's not 100%. And nasopharyngeal swab is the best specimen you can think of getting. If it is gene expert or true NAD, you will get a report within an hour or two. If it is PCR, it may take around a day or 12 hours. The, but the point that you must remember is that PCR may be positive for several weeks after infection. 
and may not mean that the patient is infectious for others. Coming to the rapid antigen tests, which are widely being performed in several states with low resources, a negative test does not rule out infection as well as PCR or gene expert. However, a positive test indicates a very high probability of COVID-19. It is not recommended in most clinical settings, but if there are constraints of resources, mass testing is required. We can perform antigen tests. A negative antigen test should not be taken lightly. The patient could still be having COVID-19. You will have to confirm the test with PCR or gene expert. Coming to the antibody test, there are lots of caveats in the sense that antibodies are two types, IgG and IgM. And they are currently recommended only for research purposes and epidemiological purposes. purposes. In pediatric practice, for diagnosis of MIS-C or PIMS-TS, pediatric multisystem inflammatory syndrome, antibody tests are of value in picking up recent or past COVID-19 infection. For diagnosis of acute COVID-19 infection, antibody tests are not recommended. The next few slides I'm going to discuss are based on a beautiful article from Arkes of Diseases Education Practice, how to use respiratory viral studies, where they clearly discuss how you interpret viral studies in respiratory infections. PCR in lower respiratory tract infection, yes, it is useful for antibiotic stewardship. Sensitivity and specificity is better than culture. You get a report within an hour or 45 minutes. Unfortunately, it has got more sensitivity than specificity. Many a time you are obliged with the positivity of more than one organism, one virus. And currently we have 22 pathogen biofire. And there is another platform which gives you a report of 33 or 35 organisms in PCR, including pneumococcus, etc. The limitations are that some viruses, particularly Boca virus, adenovirus, rhinovirus, RSV, they may persist in the airway for several weeks after the acute infection is resolved. We do not know whether the PCR positivity indicates that these viruses are responsible for the clinical syndrome the child is having because they may remain positive because of high sensitivity for quite a few weeks. Studies have shown where they have carried out population-based studies. If you do PCR from an esophageal aspirate in asymptomatic children, nearly one-fourth may have positivity for one or more viruses. That doesn't mean they have the disease. Most importantly, in a disease like RSV bronchiolitis, there is always a possibility there may be some other co-infection with one more virus or even bacteria. It is estimated that nearly one third of young infants with RSV bronchiolitis may have co-infection with some other pathogen. So these are the limitations. What then, if there are limitations, do you perform them at all? What are the indications of doing multiplex PCR, quite a costly test? Even today in the United States, an advanced country, there has been no algorithm which has been validated till date. The cost and the availability limits is used in only immunocompromised children and only in those who do not have garden variety pneumonia, who have non-responding pneumonia, 
and it is definitely useful in those who are high risk populations like those with chronic cardiac disease or those with immunodeficiency particularly the age is low children who are high risk for influenza of course pcr for influenza is extremely useful for diagnosis the most commonly detected respiratory viruses include influenza para influenza rsv adeno the new pathogens meta pneumo and boca and of course covid 19 this list includes also corona and rhino viruses the bottom line is that rt pcr has a very high sensitivity and specificity in respiratory samples but the point that we must remember most infants and children with viral lri have a mild and self limiting illness so much so wasting money and wasting our resources on viral testing is absolutely unnecessary as a routine then why do you perform this at all do you think these tests are useless these tests might be helpful in the following situations you let us look at the definite indications where this these pcr tests will be of use unfortunately if you have a nosocomial infection rsv outbreak in a nursery or influenza outbreak in a nursery or in a picu yes when there is an institutional outbreak for cohorting for isolation purpose just like covid 19 you will have to investigate two you have started a child on antibiotics thinking it could be bacterial pneumonia count suggest lymphocytosis and you are not sure whether it is bacterial or viral and if you pick up an influenza by pcr then you can start the oseltamivir and stop the antibiotic similarly if pcr is negative for influenza you can stop oseltamivir both can be done if you have concerns regarding the virulence of the strain for example you have somebody who has come from africa you expect the person to have some unusual virus then if there is a relevant travel history you perform pcr yes in immunocompromised patients yes adenovirus can be severe influenza can be severe rsv can be severe so you can consider performing pcr those who are in icu being ventilated definitely you should consider doing pcr because you may end up having a diagnosis of a rare disease like adenoviral pneumonia for which you may consider giving sidofovir and those who have a typical presentations somebody who has bronchiolitis going on for 2 3 weeks yes last but not the least in hospitals where there is lot of space constraint if you have multiple cases of infants with wheeze if you prove rsv with a pcr then you can cohort them and put them in the same ward so that they don't spread to other infants and children on the other hand if the disease is mild pcr will not be useful particularly in outpatient practice pcr testing for viruses including influenza is not required those children who clearly have a viral syndrome and who are improving and you don't have the intention to cohort them or admit them or you don't think you are going to change the management for example those with mild viral bronchiolitis or viral associated wheeze you don't have to perform pcr at all in outpatient or inpatient practice okay you have done pcr the pcr result comes as positive for say rsv adeno and more than one virus how do you interpret if your pcr report says that there is influenza positivity or rsv positivity or para influenza or meta pneumo virus it usually indicate that the virus is the culprit in other words we have an infant who has a compatible diagnosis of bronchiolitis if you get rsv pcr 
yes it confirms the diagnosis on the other hand if you get pathogens like enterovirus corona virus rhino virus detection of such viruses is less significant it may not mean that these viruses are the pathogens this becomes more relevant if you have more than one pathogen detected all because your pcr is positive you cannot automatically say that that pathogen is responsible for the clinical status or the deterioration of the given case the next question is how long children have positive pcr after recovery from a low respiratory viral infection studies have shown that virus may be detected for up to 8 to 9 days or even up to 8 to 12.5 days multiple viruses may be detected the maximum duration of detection for for each virus particularly in the case of influenza was less than 7 days shortest duration the longest duration had been with adeno and rsv this is what we should remember just because adeno virus and rsv are positive in the pcr it doesn't mean the disease is caused by those viruses these infants and children might have acquired the infection earlier and the present illness may be due to a different pathogen ultimately it is true clinical judgment and not lab diagnosis more importantly immuno compromised children can shed viruses for very long periods i said uh, rsv can be excreted for up to 6 weeks in immuno compromised children it may go on up to even 3 months and even if the virus is detected these infants and children may not be symptomatic what do you do when you get more than one virus positivity in the pcr if you get more than one virus it does not indicate that the disease is more severe and just because you get more than one virus you should not label the child as having immunodeficiency it doesn't mean anything it's clinical judgment let us move on to bacterial respiratory infections let us take the case 3 a 3 year old child with fever cough and fast breathing for one day tachypnea is there retractions are there total count is 4600 bc volume of 34 platelets 1.7 the x ray shows consolidation left lower low clinically it is diagnosed as severe community pneumonia the question that is often asked 3 year old severe pneumonia is it a typical pneumonia or mycoplasma pneumonia the next question somebody might ask if you want to diagnose mycoplasma what labs you do you have a wide array of tests now the time tested cold agglutinin test mycoplasma igm mycoplasma pcr in esophageal aspirate using the biofire or multiplex pcr none of the above which one do you perform let us look at literature and the further dilemmas are there what are the best clues to diagnose a mycoplasma pneumonia is it better to test and treat or better to treat or better to treat and test simultaneously let us try to answer these questions we'll take up the cold agglutinin test which is an age old test and that if you get a titer of more than 1 in 64 yes there is a strong possibility of this being mycoplasma pneumonia particularly when there is a clinically compatible illness suggesting micro hemolytic anemia rash extra pulmonary manifestations at the same time most textbooks have condemned the use of cold agglutinin test there is a 50 50 chance in 50% of cases it may be positive in 50% of cases it may be negative so it is no more recommended but on the other hand if you happen to perform the test if it is positive please treat it as mycoplasma pneumonia on the other hand a negative test does not rule out mycoplasma pneumonia unfortunately detection of mycoplasma using igm or using pcr does not confirm that the disease is due to 
mycoplasma pneumonia look at this study where they compare the positivity of mycoplasma pcr in respiratory secretions in children who were asymptomatic and in children with pneumonia the difference between the two was surprising in asymptomatic children pcr positivity was higher than symptomatic children 21% of normal school going children had pcr positivity whereas only 16% of pneumonias had pcr positivity so just because pcr is positive it doesn't prove it is mycoplasma pneumonia what about serology you have serology to detect igm and igg antibodies igm antibodies performed by elisa may be positive up to 3 months very similar to rsv being detected in pcr igm positivity may persist up to 3 months and there are quite a lot of pcr and igm false positives for mycoplasma pneumonia also it is said that the best way to prove is to show four fold rise in titer of igg and igm antibodies taken two weeks apart and if the four fold rise in titer is there along with pcr positivity along with clinical symptomatology then probably you are dead right in diagnosing mycoplasma pneumonia the bottom line pcr is good but it is not everything cultures are performed only in research labs it will take about 3 weeks by the time patient may be alive or dead please use a combination of pcr along with igm if both are positive probably it is the most reliable indicator of acute infection caused by mycoplasma pneumonia in other words if a child is having clinical features consistent with mycoplasma pneumonia with features of atypical pneumonia with extra pulmonary manifestations please do not wait for the test reports treat of course you can perform tests and if both igm and pcr are positive it is very likely that you are dealing with the case of mycoplasma pneumonia and you should treat it appropriately case 4 This is a 4 year old child who had fever for about 2 days temperature is 103 cough is there tachypnea retractions are there total count is 22000 you take an x ray you find a round pneumonia the question is what is the bug you know it is round pneumonia you know it is commonly due to pneumococcus The next question is: Are you sure you are dealing with pneumococcus? That's a question foremost in our mind. How do you prove the etiology, and what are the recent advances in the diagnosis of pneumococcal pneumonia? Coming to the laboratory test for pneumonia, it is very unfortunate that less than ten percent of those with pneumonia, including low bar consolidation, like what is seen in the X-ray. less than 10% only have blood culture positivity is a useless test but is only for research purpose mycoplasma igm igg limitations pcr limitations blood pcr for pneumococcus very few labs perform not standardized not recommended if you have pleural effusion or empyema pleural fluid pcr or a uh, lab side lab test called binax test can confirm pneumococcal pneumonia this detects antigen and there is another test available for diagnosis of pneumococcal pneumonia which is urinary pneumococcal antigen this is very useful in adults with pneumococcal pneumonia if it is positive in an adult with low bar consolidation it confirms pneumococcal pneumonia whereas in pediatrics particularly below the age of 5 years this urinary pneumococcal antigen test is unreliable and is not recommended why below 5 years many infants and young children may carry pneumococcus in their nasopharyngeal area 
and they may periodically excrete urinary pneumococci and your urinary antigen positivity in the urine does not confirm pneumococcal pneumonia. So the diagnosis is essentially clinical and is corroborated by high counts, more than 25,000, high CRP. If you are lucky, you may isolate the organism from the blood in less than 10% of cases. You may get it from the pleural fluid. Of course, nasopharyngeal aspirate with multiplex PCR, including pneumococcus, is useful, but it is recommended only in non-responding pneumonia or in immunocompromised host. A biopsy culture is considered the gold standard, often not performed in pneumococcal pneumonia. The next question is, it is, is it possible to prove pneumococcal pneumonia? We talk about Western data. Fortunately, we have now enough Indian data where as part of a surveillance study in India, we identified severe pneumococcal disease in the form of invasive pneumococcal disease. 83 children had severe pneumonia and we proved that there is increase in antimicrobial resistance, particularly to penicillin. Recently, from our own hospital, we published our retrospective analysis of invasive pneumococcal disease, 33 confirmed cases, all proven with blood culture, CSF culture, or pleural fluid culture. And, and it we showed that majority were due to, majority of the invasive pneumococcal disease was due to pneumococcus. Why am I talking about it? Even though less than 10% of pneumonias only yield culture positivity, it is necessary to perform cultures and it might be useful to perform PCR studies to confirm pneumococcal pneumonia where the drug resistance is becoming a big threat. Case number five. This is a neonate with, who was 26 days old the neonate had low-grade fever and cough for about four days. And on inquiry, the entire family was coughing. Everybody was coughing. And the cough has been worsening. And the baby was absolutely well between episodes. And on day five of illness, the baby had started developing apnea and intermittent cyanosis. X-ray was taken, which was normal. And they, by the time they came to us on day seven, we did a count which showed 28,000 lymphocytes, 90%. I'm sure all of you would be able to guess the diagnosis, cough, apnea, intermittent cyanosis, leukocytosis, lymphocytosis, nothing else other than pertussis, isn't it? So the question that you ask, how do you confirm the diagnosis of pertussis? What lab test do you do? Do you do culture for pertussis, cough plate test, abandoned now? Do you do PCR? Do you use the biofair nasopharyngeal aspirate? Or do you do a bowel for bacterial cultures? In fact, today, our biofair comes to our rescue. In this infant, we got a biofair done. We, we detected bordetella pertussis. As expected, we also picked up rhinovirus and enterovirus. That was not the cause for the illness, and it was nothing but pertussis. Lab diagnosis of pertussis is very difficult. Why? Culture is considered the gold standard, unfortunately, even today. Not available, not performed. Sensitivity is very low. PCR is excellent very high sensitivity, rapid turnover on time. It costs, even if you want to do PCR for purposes alone, is now available at a cost of around 3,000 to 4,000 rupees, worth doing it. Mind you, lymphocytosis might occur only in the second week. And most importantly, early diagnosis of purposes is very important to prevent the community spread of the illness. Unless you start treatment very early, the child's illness course will not be altered. Not only that, by treating early, you are preventing infectiousness in the index case to the others in the community. So 
lab diagnosis with PCR is definitely needed for diagnosis of pertussis. Case six, this is an infant who had failure to thrive, three months old, was weighing only 2.8 kg. Child had a severe pneumonia with air leak, subcutaneous emphysema, pneumothorax, pneumonia. And there is oil, history of oily stools from birth. We did a bar, which grew bucket area. That gave us the diagnosis. I'm sure the audience will guess it is a straightforward case of cystic fibrosis. Now the question in terms of investigation, when do you do bronchoalveolar lavage for lab diagnosis of respiratory tract infection? And if you happen to do a bronchoalveolar lavage, what lab test will you ask for diagnosis of respiratory tract infection? BAL can be done if facilities are available using fiber optic bronchoscope for taking aspirates. You can also perform brush or transbronchial biopsy for pathological and microbiological diagnosis of conditions including tuberculosis. And the samples must be sent for cytology, histopathology, and even galactamanon. And fiber optic or bronchoscopy is ideal unless there is a foreign body for which you require a rigid bronchoscopy. Bowel specimens are very useful for diagnosis of tuberculosis. We have had cases where we have proven tuberculosis only with bowel after repeated attempts to get the organism from gene expert in the gastric juice. We have picked up A, Bs from bowel. Viruses, including adenoviruses, can be picked up. Diagnosis of PCP is often made with bowel specimens. Fungi, particularly aspergillosis, is often diagnosed using bowel galactaminin. And unusual organisms like melioidosis, brucellosis can be picked up by doing a bowel. Of course, it's a tertiary level procedure. It's highly invasive, not easily available. But the other point is you, at times, you may get in the bowel a low growth of pseudomonas. You have to do colony counts and interpret clinically to differentiate colonization versus true infection. In my last part, I'm going to talk about the future of lab investigations in respiratory tract infections. We all know new molecular tests like multiplex PCR have emerged in a big way. They have changed our practice. We are picking up more and more cases of unusual viral infections. However, these molecular diagnostic tests like PCR, diphtheria PCR, or 16 as RNA, or detection of diphtheria using multidoff, influenza PCR, definitely help in early diagnosis. They definitely help us to use appropriate antibiotics. They definitely help us to implement isolation precautions. Taking the example of COVID-19. Currently, so many commercial panels are available in the United States. Most of them are not available, except film array and few others which are available in India. They are being standardized. With the availability of these tests, a poor general pediatrician like me often has difficulties in interpreting these tests and treating the patients rationally. What do you think people like me should do? First thing, when you have a patient with a respiratory infection, thorough clinical evaluation is required. For example, we have clinically a woof Clinically, a membrane suggested diphtheria. Clinically, you have a MECRISEF score four or five. You can make a diagnosis of diphtheria, group A beta hemolytic streptococcus, whooping cough, clinically. And you must practice diagnostic stewardship. You should perform the right tests at the right time for the right patient. You should not be wasting the resources. And once you do a rapid diagnostic test like PCR, you must always interact with the microbiologist to get the correct diagnosis. 
and you should get the correct report from the microbiologist and you should practice antimicrobial stewardship by interpreting the reports appropriately and use the right antimicrobial at the right time in other words the basic principles of utilizing labs in rti consists of good clinical evaluation rational performance of rapid diagnostic tests sensible interaction with the microbiologists and antimicrobial stewardship and follow up what is new what is revolutionizing the molecular diagnosis in rti multi doc what is this multi doc it is matrix assisted laser desorption or ionization time of light mass spectrometry it is a molecular diagnostic test which is very highly sensitive it could give you reports within few minutes just like gene expert the next is 16 as rna which is called sequence based technology the disadvantage of these tests is the high sensitivity if you give them a specimen they may report multiple pathogens but in a patient who is in icu who is critically ill if these tests pick up something like diphtheria something like meliodosis something like pseudomonas it will make a lot of difference to the patient who is sick and being ventilated in the pcu we can use them rationally of course i am going to end my talk with key questions for future research what should we do in future we should identify children with viral lri who will develop severe disease predict the risk of severe disease with molecular methods the new techniques are emerging where they are trying to quantify the rna or the dna of the viruses and trying to predict whether they are real pathogens or not the technology is being refined the impact of multiple virus detection viral load in relation to disease severity studies are going on we will get the answer soon last but not the least we should assess the impact of point of care tests on clinical management in emergency department and clinical settings like uh, rapid antigen tests for streptococcus in future we may get rapid antigen tests for various viruses and bacteria in office practice wherein we can have a diagnosis within few minutes in our office itself in the end what we need but what we do not have is that for patients with rti at any point of care we need a fantastic rapid diagnostic test where a clinician will be able to take a non invasive test perform a simple test put the specimen into the machine that machine should give you an answer within few minutes this is bacterial this is viral this is true infection this is severe infection this is invasive infection so that we are also guided about the diagnosis and also about diagnostic uh, uh, accuracy and also about complications and also about antibiotic sensitivity of course this is asking for too much but i am sure in future we will definitely have such devices even in office practice where the moment patient comes to you with an rti you have a chip you take a specimen put it you get all the results within few minutes i am not asking i know i am asking for the moon but the moon is not far away thank you very much if you have feedback please mail at sbsb@gmail.com thank you thank you so much sir for your presentation and elaborating on the laboratory investigations of rti with your clinical perspective
we now request you to take some of the questions that are posted, sir. Uh, I may read it out to you and you have a discussion on the same, sir. So Dr. A. Jagadeesan asks if specific tests for viral infections are there and what are they? See, specific tests currently in use are for H1N1. You have a PCR. And of course, you have COVID-19 PCR as well as gene expert. You have a rapid antigen test for RSV. And you have multiplex PCR, depending on the platform you use for 15 pathogens or 33 pathogens or 35 pathogens. Almost all common viral infections, starting from influenza, para-influenza, BOCA, metanumo, Rio, Rhino, Entro, Corona, COVID-19. For all these viral infections, we have platforms which give you a report within an hour or 45 minutes. They are expensive. They have very high sensitivity, but have very poor specificity. They, they report positivity might not indicate immediately that this child is definitely having the syndrome or the clinical spectrum due to the virus, which is detected by the machine. Yes, sir. Uh, we have another question, sir, from Dr. Sandeep, sir. He asks if same nasopharyngeal or nasopharyngeal aspirates uh, and pharyngeal swabs can be done in the same single multiplex PCR machine run for all indicated RTIs. Actually, if you if you are talking about the ideal specimen for uh, multiplex PCR test, the best is probably bulk because you are crossing the upper airway, you know you're not taking taking specimens from the colonized upper respiratory tract. Ball is the best, but it is invasive. Of course, if you have a pleural fluid or a lung biopsy specimen, yes, it is ideal. It is very specific. The next is the nasopharyngeal aspirate. That is better than pharyngeal swab. Pharyngeal swab, even in COVID-19, is inferior to nasopharyngeal swab or aspirate. Nasopharyngeal aspirate is the best. Nasopharyngeal swab is the next. Pharyngeal swab is the least sensitive. Okay. Yes, sir. He also adds another question related to his first question. He asks if, uh, is the cost of the single PCR and versus all the other RTI viruses PCR, are they are they the same and single uh, same run multiplex PCR? Always a single uh, PCR test is cheaper than multiplex PCR. For example, you have H1N1 PCR. Nowadays the cost has come to around thousand rupees. We know the COVID nineteen PCR. The cost is hovering around. 2,500 to 3,500 rupees. The gene expert of the PUNAT is cheaper. Rapid antigen test is much cheaper. But if you perform a biofire, it costs around five to 7,500 rupees, maybe 10,000 rupees in some centers. If you use platforms which carry out tests for 33 pathogens, the cost is definitely going to be higher. It depends on the kit you are using and the place where you're working. But if your volume is always large, can always negotiate with the company to bring down the price. For example, the biofire, which costs around uh, 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 seven, anywhere between 7,500 to 15,000 rupees. If you perform only purchases PCR, it costs only around 4,000 rupees. So it is much cheaper. Okay. Yes. Sir, we have a question from Dr. Radha Krishnan, sir. He asks if antiviral agents commonly used in pediatric pneumonia. Because the moment we think of H1N1, if it is a severe disease, high risk patients, category C patients, as per the Government of India guideline, you're going to give, and category B also, you're going to give Oseltamavir based on the algorithm given by the Government of India. That's number one. Number two is antiviral agents. The other antiviral agents which may be of use includes remdesivir and remdesivir is currently 
recommended for moderate to severe cases is not recommended routinely for mildly symptomatic covid 19 other antiviral drugs which may be rarely used include acyclovir if there is herpes simplex or varicella pneumonia or sildenafil if there is adenoviral pneumonia and of course uh, nebulized ribavirin may be of use in severe rsv pneumonia other antiviral agents have very limited use i myself don't have much experience they may be used in special situations based on molecular diagnosis clinical interpretation and assessment of the immune status of the individual for example you have a cmv pneumonia you may have to resort to using gancyclovir or valgancyclovir with all the precautions confirming the diagnosis particularly in immunodeficient individuals post transplant individuals young infants with severe disease yes we have a question from dr rajendra uh, he asks if uh, we see family positive for corona rt pcr but kids turn negative in spite of symptoms what could be done basically covid 19 in majority of infants and young children is either asymptomatic or presents with a mild illness so if rt pcr is negative if there is a contact all that is required is three ps one is paracetamol two is proper parental counseling on the warning signs quarantine three prompt diagnosis of pims ts pediatric multi system inflammatory syndrome which again is more common above the age of 5 years we don't have to worry we have to only counsel them for warning signs not them to get hospitalized if required like adults young children we need not monitor the pulse oximetry unless the child has got a special situation like immunocompromised state or a chronic systemic disease etc okay. counseling paracetamol nothing else so dr sandeep asks you to comment on common viral co infections with covid and common secondary bacterial infections with covid the incidence of uh, secondary bacterial infections is very low uh even in literature the incidence is very low i can quote from experience at our hospital covid may be a bystander in many a child who has otherwise a serious bacterial infection in fact we have uh, seen enteric fever culture proven with covid positivity covid 19 gave her gave problems to the child we treated the enteric fever we did not treat the covid 19 one example two we have had children with brucellosis there were there was one case in our icu brucellosis which also had covid 19 positivity we had tuberculosis covid 19 was a bystander we had quite a few cases of dysentery of course we could not prove the organism these are the things which have come across they are by and large very rare covid 19 per se can give rise to secondary infections for few reasons one if a patient with covid 19 receives immunosuppressive drugs like corticosteroids or tocilizumab they may develop nosocomial infection touch wood we have not had the misfortune of having such cases nadal cs it can occur in pediatric results it can occur we must be careful to recognize them early two covid 19 by itself it is postulated may suppress t cell immunity temporarily generally and may predispose the child to 
other infection this is a hypothesis but most literature reports suggest that secondary serious bacterial infections secondary the word secondary i'm stressing are uncommon and in primary in primary bacterial infections covid 19 may be a asymptomatic illness the bacterial infection may be the one which is responsible for the symptoms i would like to stress here just because covid 19 is around pediatricians particularly general pediatricians like me should not forget the diagnosis syndromic diagnosis of garden variety illnesses like acute febrile encephalopathy pneumonia meningitis urinary we have seen quite a few urinary infections with covid positivity we should not forget them and fail to treat them thinking the whole disease spectrum in a given child is only due to covid 19 yes sir so dr rashik is asks us uh, rt pcr negative although ct severity score is high so what could be really done you must remember rt pcr has a sensitivity of only 70% you also must uh, make sure that the swabs are done properly technique of collection of specimen storage transport has to be proper if you clinically think strongly that it is covid 19 infection if one rt pcr is negative it is better to take all the precautions and if necessary repeat so just because it is negative doesn't mean anything like adults who undergo ct thorax if rt pcr is negative in pediatric practice i am afraid that is not required or rational ct thorax may oblige you with some non specific findings we should not be making a diagnosis of pediatric covid 19 purely based on ct thorax finding but there may be some other clues in the laboratory like high crp lymphopenia low sodium which could give a clue to the diagnosis of covid 19 in such cases you must be careful in simply going by one negative pcr report yes so dr sandeep asks us sir, which category or group of kids or children are prone to get severe covid two or three things one surprisingly immunodeficient children cancer children with and uh, with uh, with chemotherapy children with chronic diseases they have not done badly with covid 19 in fact there are some initial reports which suggest that in immunodeficient children covid 19 may not be a serious illness at all they get away uh, 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 from the illness very well we really do not know the exact prognostic factors in pediatric covid like in adult covid but two or three factors have been identified to adversely affect the prognosis in covid 19 one higher age two newborns three high body mass index obese children because i believe in obese uh, uh, children the adipose tissue adipose tissue has a propensity to cause very high elevations of il6 they are more prone for cytokine storm they are more prone for venous thrombosis obesity these are some of the factors which have been shown to affect prognosis in covid 19 in children above 5 years 
the risk of miss c or pims ts pd uh, uh, multi system inflammatory syndrome is more than the risk of severe covid 19 pneumonia or cytokine storm by and large covid 19 is a very friendly illness in children the reasons are still not understood whether it is something to do with only yes receptors in the lung we do not know whether it is because of their prior exposure to corona viruses we do not know yes sir yes sir thank you sir uh, i think with that we come to the end of the questions thank you so much for taking up the questions patiently and also for the presentation also thank all the respected doctors for participating and having joined the webinar this time thank you all thank you thank you so much